If you've been following along with us, we just started last week this uh, series called Made for Mission. And Derek talked about, uh, he introduced this concept of BLESS, this acronym that we're going to use of the word BLESS. And each word, as it's an acronym, stands for something. Begin with prayer. Derek laid that out, how Jesus was baptized with the Holy Spirit, baptized in water, began his ministry with prayer, overcoming temptation as we should. We should begin every day with prayer prayer. Jesus continued that throughout his ministry. He would retreat to places alone. Many times we see that in scripture where he would go alone and he would pray. So prayer was this undergirding foundation uh, that even Jesus practiced himself. And he did it for himself, but he also did it as an example for how we are to live our lives. And many times when uh, we are weak, when we are being um, attacked or stressed out, a lot of times that's because we've lost contact with the Lord. We're, we're not in prayer a lot of times. Today we're going to be going over L, listen with care. And I'm going to be honest with you, when I was kind of figuring out like, well, how do I preach a sermon on listen? I, I felt a little bit empty handed. I was just like, oh, okay, I'm just going to tell them you guys to listen better. You should just open your ears, just pay attention more. And I just felt like a parent saying that, like, pay attention. But as I've um, prayed through this and, and read and, and asked the Lord what he wants to speak, I do feel like he has something. I know, he's, I know he spoke to me personally because, honestly, I just, and Derek and I were talking about this early on when I signed on at Collective. We were out for lunch one day or something. I don't know. We were out somewhere. I wasn't paying attention either. And uh, <laughs> I remember talking to Derek in about 10 seconds, maybe, I'm giving you a lot of benefit there. About 10 seconds in the conversation, he just glazed over, and he's just looking around. And I realized, he's not listening to me. He doesn't understand anything that I'm saying. And later on, he came back, and he apologized for that. He said, look, dude, I have a hard time paying attention. I have a hard time listening. So I think listening is something, truly listening is a skill, and it's something that we all struggle with. So we're going to do an exercise today, okay? In 1951... This is the setup for what we're about to do. 1951, there was an American experimental composer. His name was John Cage. Okay? He visited Harvard University. And at Harvard, they have what's called an anechoic chamber. Okay? You write that word down. If you learn how to spell it, let me know. Anechoic chamber means it's a room that's been treated internally to where there's no reflective surfaces. So basically, when you hear a sound... You hear the room color and interact with the sound. You don't just hear the direct sound. You hear early reflections, late reflections, reverbs. You can tell I'm a music nerd, right? You, you hear all of these different sounds coloring the initial sound, okay? When he walked into this room, you're supposed to hear nothing. It's also insulated, completely soundproofed from the outside. So you don't hear cars passing by, dogs barking. You don't hear anything. It's a completely silent room. And he walked into this room expecting to hear absolutely nothing. And as he stood there and he listened, he heard two sounds. It was a very high-pitched sound and a very low-pitched sound. And he was kind of stumped by that, so he went to the engineer of the building. He said, what, what is that? I thought this was supposed to be a soundproof room. And the guy said, well, the high-pitched sound that you hear is your nervous system. You hear your nervous system running. That's how well we can listen. He said, and the low pitch sound is your blood flowing through your veins. Isn't that crazy? It's a true story. This, uh, this instance, this situation influenced him, along with a few others, influenced him to write a piece of music called Min Four Minutes and 33 Seconds. And we're going to perform that piece of music together this morning. So if anyone ever tells you you're not a musician, you're about to be. Four minutes and 33 seconds is exactly what it sounds like. Four, four minutes, 33 seconds of complete silence. The musicians would get their instruments, and they would get in position, and then the whole song was just a rest. A rest is a moment of time when the music we're not supposed to play. The whole song was a rest. And it was meant, they would actually do this in concerts, and it was meant to include the audience, where they now become participants in the music, so whether they cough or sneeze or <clears throat> other things, anything that happens outside now becomes a part of that composition. And so it's ever-changing composition. So we're going to do that this morning. Not four minutes and 33 seconds. We ain't got time for that. Ain't nobody got time for that. 
That's why it's written back in the 50s and never performed again. Okay. But we're going to do this. You ready? I'm going to set a stopwatch. And there is a purpose. So here we go. I'm going to count us off. I don't know if this is the way it's supposed to do it, but we're going to do it because it feels official. You ready? One, two, three, four. That's the quietest my kids have been all week. <laughs> that was about 35 seconds worth of that song. I don't know about you guys, but about 23 seconds in, I started to hear things I, I, that my conscious mind would not even register a while ago. I started to hear the kids in the background. I started to hear the hum of the lights. I started to hear little movements that I'd never even noticed before. Started to hear people breathe, right? Listening is a posture that we take, and it's not one that we're often in. So this piece of music is the performance of silence, which causes you to activate your listening. This act of listening now becomes musicianship. So today, you performed part of a classical piece of music. Good job. So what does this have to do with us in church, right? That's all fun and dandy. We did that in college, and I was like, oh, it's the coolest day in college. You know, I was 21, I didn't care. But, but what becomes, what, what does this principle teach us about witnessing, about sharing the gospel? And I would say this, just as the act of listening can be musicianship, the act of listening can also be evangelism. And I'm going to show you what I mean. A lot of times we think that to be an evangelist, you've got to go like straight, crazy street preacher mode. You've got to go stand on a box on the corner of the street. You've got to yell and you've got to preach in people's face. You've got to get out and you've got to do apologetics and back and forth until you convince people into salvation. You know, some people, they... They sell everything they have, they uh, take their families, and they pick up and they move to some foreign country like India or Iraq or Russia or Arkansas or someplace like that, and they, they try to, right? They're called to the mission field. Sorry if you're from, I'm not sorry if you're from Arkansas. <laughs> I mean, but I am sorry that you're from Arkansas. Sorry, okay, not sorry. That's an infinite loop there. But we're not all called to live that way. Typically, or our, our, normally, our lives, for, for most people in here, will look pretty typical, right? You got, you got a family, you got kids, you got a job. But yet there's this press from the Bible and the church, this message that says, no, we're supposed to go out and evangelize. So what does that look like for us as unprofessional ministry or ministers, right? Barna Group did a study and asked people what they value in a person with whom they would talk about spiritual matters. They asked unbelievers. They had three top results. These are it. I think we can learn a lot from this study. They wanted somebody who would listen without judgment. They wanted someone who would listen without judgment. I want to give you two definitions for judgment so that we can understand what this means. Because the Bible does tell us to judge. It says, you will know a tree by its fruit. But the Bible says that there's one judge, and that's Christ. So he's talking about the ability to execute sentence or, or to condemn someone. So there's two definitions of judgment. One is condemnation, to condemn or, or exercise sentence. And then the other is discernment. And that's what we are called to do as Christ followers, discernment. So we are allowed to discern and to judge their situation, but we're not allowed to condemn them and make we shouldn't be making pre uh what is it presumptive or we shouldn't presume things about them when we're speaking to them so they want somebody to listen without judgment or condemnation they want someone who will allow them to draw their own conclusions 
I struggled with that. I was like, if they were allowed to draw their own conclusions, they would have already got the right one. That would be Jesus. So you need to sit down and shut up, and I'm going to tell you about Jesus because you need the right conclusion. Right? If they, don't, if they left to their own devices, they're going to be exactly where they are, unsaved. So I need to help them. Although that's true, they want someone who's going to help lead them. Acts 17, 26 through 27 says this, And God made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined allotted periods and boundaries of their dwelling places. So God determined where you're going to be, where you're going to live, and what you're going to do, that they should seek God and perhaps feel their way toward him and find him. Yet he is actually not far from each one of us. That verse really me to understand that, you know what, I don't have to, to force people into Jesus, but I do need to be there to guide them to him. Because at the end of the day, people are seeking, and what they're seeking is God, whether they know it or not. The Barna, uh, Barna group did another study, and they found that 87% of people are actually interested in Christianity and what it can mean for their lives. 87% of people. That's a lot. That's a lot. But the next thing that they desired, the number three top thing was they wanted someone who was confident in sharing their own perspective. So they do want to hear what you have to say. But there's this, uh, they give us the, the, the outline. That, you know, if you go to a physician, a good physician at least, they're going to ask you what's wrong. And you're going to tell them. They're going to listen first before prescribing uh, a medication or treatment, right? They're going to listen first. The doctor who invented the stethoscope, because uh, he was uncomfortable about placing his ear up against a woman's chest, he, he invented the stethoscope. And what he told his students when he gave it to them was, don't stop listening. How odd that he would give them something to listen with, and then he would say, don't stop listening. And he was talking about, don't stop listening to their words, he said, because they will tell you how to heal them if you just let them talk. And there's a lot of carryover that we can take from these principles into our lives as everyday followers of Jesus. Like that little plug of our mission statement, hmm? Like that? Some good stuff. So in short, people are looking for a friend who will give good news, be good news, and share good news in their own story. You know, it's interesting, uh, especially in a world we live in where there's like this demand to understand everything that you, about everything that you believe. Like apologetics is a big deal, right? I don't know if y'all, any of y'all have felt that, but apologetics is a big deal. And then I found this number. Did you know that Jesus asked more questions than he answered? He asked 307 questions and, and answered three, to be exact. He asked 307 and only answered three questions. There's an old saying that people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. Are you guys feeling what I'm trying to say? We need to open our ears and listen. We need to be ready to hear people's story because they will tell us what's wrong and we will be able to meet them with a solution, which is a Christ-centered solution, the comfort of the Holy Spirit, the salvation from sin, right? I love what Dave Ferguson calls it. This is the guy who wrote the book that Derek and I are kind of going off of as we go through this series. Um, he calls it paying the relational rent. Paying the relational rent. How many times have you been in the conversation with somebody and you're just like, I don't even know you, don't care what you have to say, stop talking to me. Maybe, am I the only one? Or am I just the only one honest enough to admit it? Right? You be in those conversations. But if you're, if you're in a, I think about Casey. Like, Casey could probably tell me anything at this point. But that's because he's invested so much into my life, and I trust him. I trust him. Matthew eleven nineteen 19 calls Jesus a friend of tax collectors and sinners. A friend of tax collectors and sinners. This was meant by, as an insult by the Pharisees. The Pharisees are trying to insult him, saying, you hang out with these losers of society. And Jesus said, you're right, I do. He's come for the sick. 
Let's, uh, let's get into some scripture here. I know it's, it's been a little while, but I wanted you guys to feel where we're going with this. <clears throat> if you have your Bibles, you're welcome to turn to Luke 18, 35 through 40, or the verses will be on the screen. It says, as he drew near to Jericho, talking about Jesus, he was, a uh, little set up, he was just passing through the area. He was headed somewhere else. What we're about to see this encounter is a total random reaction or total random situation. I love what Casey calls it, uh, divine interruptions. And these happen all the time, I think. And, and we live our lives just in tunnel vision, but Jesus did not. It says, as he drew near to Jericho, a blind man was sitting by the roadside begging. And hearing a crowd going by, he inquired what this meant. The people told him, Jesus of Nazareth is passing by. And so the man cried out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And those who were in front of the crowd rebuked him, telling him, be silent, get back, get back over there. But he cried out all the more, son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stopped and commanded him to be brought to him. And when he came near, Jesus asked him, there's the question, what do you want me to do for you? You'd think that'd be pretty obvious, wouldn't you? Just hauled the blind man to him. But he asked him, what do you want me to do for you? He said, Lord, let me recover my sight. And Jesus said to him, recover your sight. Your faith has made you well. Situations like this, scriptures like this, it's easy to see the miracle. And, and that's kind of the point, right? We, that's part of the point of the story is the miracle. And it's easy to see that. And we, that's the glittery thing in the scripture. That's the amazing thing that draws our attention is this miracle. But something more important is happening here. And it's the way that Jesus is choosing to interact with someone. He is choosing to place value on this person, this person that society has outcast, considered not worth listening to. They all heard him, and they were ignoring him. And I just wonder how many times in my life do I walk by people that have looks on their faces or a countenance upon them that I could simply say, hey, are you okay? What's going on? What's going on? And I choose not to interact with them. Because it wasn't on my agenda. It wasn't on the itinerary. But Jesus saw him as a person. He didn't see the miracle. He didn't see this person as a means for his miracle. Oh, I I need to tell people who I am. I want you to go out and, and tell people who healed you. Jesus wasn't using this to gain popularity and fame. He was using it to draw attention to the fact that he was valuable as a person. This person on the fringes is made in his very image. He wasn't just another notch on the pistol of Jesus' miracles. Why don't we take time to listen? Why is listening so hard? Well, because it takes time. It takes time. It takes surrender. It takes selflessness to sit there and say, I care about what you have to say takes work to read between the lines, right? Some people aren't even good at talking. And the words they say don't even describe what they're trying to say. You've heard, this, you've heard the saying, read between the lines. I think there's a call for us as Christians to listen between the words. As people talk, we're trying to discern what's actually going on so that we can meet them and help them. It's difficult. It's difficult to not just think of a response, I, my wife and I do this all the time. She'll be talking, and I'm just thinking about what I'm about to say. You guys ever do that? I'm, I'm, again, I must be the only one. It's difficult to put down our want to be heard and interject in the situation and just truly care and say, I'm here for you. So let's uh, go to the second scripture, John chapter 5. Verses 1 through 8. We're going to see a similar instance. It says, After this there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there is in Jerusalem by the sheep gate a pool. In Aramaic it's called Bethesda. You may have heard of this pool. It was, a, it was believed that um, as the waters were stirred at a certain point, if you got in, 
you get healed. And so it was surrounded by invalids, people with physical illnesses. It says, in the, uh, yeah, it was the, uh, in Aramaic called Bethesda, which had five roofed colonnades. There were roofed areas right around the pool. They could sit in the shade and wait for the waters to be served. It says, in these lay a multitude of in- invalids, blind, lame, and paralyzed. One man was there who had been there, uh, who had been an invalid for 38 years years when Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he had already been there a long time he already knew he said to him do you want to be healed I mean the obvious answer is duh right and Jesus could have easily walked by probably never said a word and just like healed him never even had to be there But what was he doing? He was drawing attention to the fact that he was not only in need, but he was valuable as a person. This man had been outcast for 38 years. No one even helped him get into the pool. Can you think about being that lonely for that long? And Jesus walked up to him and said, Hey, you want to be healed? And the man didn't just say, Yeah. Let's go. He said, the sick man answered, Sir, I have no one to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up. And while I'm going, another steps down before me. Jesus said to him, Get up and take your bed and walk. And at once the man was healed and took up his bed and walked. Again, it's easy to look at the miracle. But it's important for us, if we are going to be true Christ followers and learn to walk and live as he lived... We have to look at what he did and why he did it. He cared enough about people to interact with them. Jesus, God, came in incarnate flesh and dwelt among us. He took the time to feel what we feel, to carry what we carry. That's powerful. So Jesus asked questions. He listened to the man and his story, and then he gave testimony about himself. I'm going to give you a main idea this morning. I I couldn't come up with anything catchy or anything better than this. I just kept coming back to this. But it's a quote by Dallas Willard. The first act of love is always the giving of attention. The first act of love is always the giving of attention. Scripture is replete and full of examples like we just read. These kinds of interactions, these divine interruptions. And it would be easy to say, yeah, that was the Son of God, though. But Jesus said, you'll do greater things than these when the Holy Spirit comes. Are we paying attention throughout our day for divine interruptions, looking for opportunities? Philippians 2, 4 gives us this charge. It says, let each of you not look not only to his own interests but also to the interests of others. That's really hard. It's really hard to genuinely put my own interests down and to invest my time and attention into someone else. There was a a group of missionaries who went to India. True story, a group of uh, missionaries went to this remote part of India. And uh, it was a pretty poor area. And they went in and they told the people, they said, look, we're going we're gonna to build a hospital because we want to care for you. We want to take care of your sicknesses and illnesses and, and help you guys get healthy. We're going to build a hospital. And then they told them, all right, now, now we're going uh, to build a church that you can worship in. We're going to teach you about God. And then they said, we're going to build a school. We're going to educate people. We're going to contribute to the financial success and future of your area and then at one point someone finally asked him what can what do you want us to do for you and the answer surprised them they said we would like a zip code we just want a mailbox and they were like what they said well without without a zip code without an area code you can't 
No one knows we're even out here. We can't send correspondence back and forth. We can't communicate to the government. We can't take part in the, the benefits of our country. We can't, we're not even seen out here. We're not even known. And they thought, well, that's, that's real simple. It took them two years to get a zip code for that area. Sometimes our interactions with people and leading them to Christ and helping them find a rich relationship with Christ will take time. But we have to be willing not to just go out there and think we know what they need. They need Jesus. Jesus, if you really mean it. We, we can't just approach people assuming we know what they need. And this is where we take the example of Jesus and we ask questions trying to get people talking. A pastor gave an example one time of um, there was a guy in a small group that was just constantly talking, never let anybody else talk. You know, I'm not going to make any jokes, but sometimes I might be that person in our small group, I'm just saying. But this guy would never stop talking. And the pastor kind of got fed up with it. And he was like, okay, well, i got to say something. So he went to the guy and he said, hey, look, man, I'm glad you're into this. He said, but really, you need to give some space. You need to stop talking because people don't even really want to be around you right now. And he just gave it to him straight, ripped the Band-Aid off. And he said the guy just downcast, just his face fell, his countenance fell. And he was like, oh, no, I just messed up. So he asked the guy, what's, what's the matter? He said, with my job, he said, this is the only human interaction I get once a week. He said, I'm afraid if I don't talk to people, they're not going to want to talk to me. And this pastor realized he probably should ask questions first. Yeah, the guy may need to hear that, but he could have heard it with a better heart if he'd had a conversation first. Don't presume to know the answer. David Augsburger, what a name, authored a book called Caring Enough to Hear and Be Heard. And he said this, being heard is as close to being loved that for the average person they are almost indistinguishable. indistinguishable. That's powerful, y'all. Think about your marriages. Think about your kids. How much time do you talk with your kids? much less people who are outside of your normal bonds of relationship. But being heard is as close to being loved for the, that the average person, it's almost indistinguishable. The problem is most people are more interested in what they have to do and what they have to say than taking the time to listen. David Ferguson said this, everyone has a story, but few people who will listen to that story. And I think that's true. When you find a friend who will converse with you about the deep things in your life, what an incredible moment that is. Is that not such a relief to be able just to talk sometimes and say, man, this is what I got going on. And to know that you're seen and heard, that's an incredible feeling. And there are there are millions of people out there who, who don't really have someone like that. They're interested in knowing what Christianity can do for their lives, and yet no one will listen to their story and help them connect the dots and feel their way to Jesus, as the Scripture says. I was thinking about this concept of listening, and I was just like, all this sounds good. All this sounds like good social technique. But I started to think, well, I, I want more, God. I want to understand more from the scripture. Why is this so important? Why is it so important, important that we take time to hear people's story? How, how is that such an effective thing in helping people find you? But is it not our very access to God that displays this principle best? To be heard and known by Him. For us to be known and heard by Him. We perceive that as love. Psalm 116 verses 1 and 2 says, I love the Lord because He has heard my voice and my pleas for mercy. It says, because He has inclined His ear 
to me. Therefore, I will call on him as long as I live. It's God's ability to listen to us and willingness to listen to us that draws us to him. How much more when we open, when we shut our mouths and open our ears and our heart and patiently listen, will that draw people into your story? Will that draw people into Christ, hopefully? I made up a graphic here. Actually, Derek made up a graphic here. But I think it's a good visual representation. Someone who is unheard and unknown feels unloved. And someone who is heard, someone who is being known, will feel loved. The Bible says that a gift makes room for the giver. I want you to think about that. The gift makes room for the giver. Jesus' sacrifice on the cross made room for him in our hearts. Our act of listening will make room for our testimony to be planted when we have paid that relational rent, if that makes sense. Even Jesus on the cross, I started to think about this. The Bible says that Jesus has struggled in every way that we have struggled. He has felt our infirmities, yet without sin. The Bible says our sin was placed upon him. Even Jesus has felt unheard. Scripture tells us that when he was on the cross, sin, our sin was laid upon him. And for a moment, the father had to turn away because he couldn't bear to see his son covered in our sin. And he had to turn away. And Jesus said the famous words, My God, why have you forsaken me? So to feel unknown is to feel unloved. And I hope you feel that this morning. It's that simple to have a conversation and to express the love of Christ through a listening heart. Um, you guys can come up. This is a very short sermon. I don't think it needs to be any more than it is. Um, I wrote this down. You can write it down as well. Listening is the first preaching of the gospel. Listening is the first preaching of the gospel. And as I think about how God listens to me and calls my heart, calls me, draws me to himself because of his open heart and open ear towards me, I think that's true. We open our heart and our ears to other people. It will be the first preaching of the gospel to that person. They may not even know God. They're going to be, they may even be an unbeliever, but they're going to experience the sweetness of that relationship that we have with God the Father to be known and heard by him. They're going to experience that in relationship, and they're going to be drawn to that. Being heard is as close to being loved that for the average person, they are almost indistinguishable. I want you to walk away with that this morning. Loving people is pretty easy. And again, most people want to hear about Christianity and how it interacts with their life and what it could mean for them. Most people want to hear that. That's pretty cool. G uh, Derek preached last week. He said, um, quoted Jesus, said, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Pray to the Lord of the harvest that he'll send laborers. And I would say ours is this week just pray to the Lord of the harvest that he would send listeners. Um, Derek's gone through a lot of footwork to create um, in our church app. You can go to the app store or whatever and just download Collective Church. Um, he's gone through a lot of work to create a little bit of infrastructure uh, and accountability and be able to write some things down and, and see how you're progressing in, in your evangelism in your everyday life. So if you go download that, um, there is a link for beginning with prayer. There's one for listening. And I would encourage you, if you haven't done the one from last week, which is uh, to name, write a list of 10 unsaved people that you know and begin to pray for them. If you haven't done that, start there. And if you've done that, um, I want to encourage you to take the next step. And our goal this week is to have 10 interactions where we have intentionally listened. We have made room and space 
for someone that we wouldn't normally make room or space for in our life and try to listen to them and have intentional, meaningful conversation with them. Does that make sense? And you can go to the app and you can write down your progress. Um, It's just a simple way to, to track it and to encourage yourself. I want to encourage you to do that. Let's pray this morning.